Thank you. Innovation. So I, this talk will be about innovation. And it's kind of like the underlying theme to how we approach things at Vuga. And I think the best way to talk about sort of uh, innovation is not like think about process and how you do it, but actually show it what we've done. So let's talk how we are innovating at Vuga and what's the next step in that innovation cycle. So we come from Vuga, and at Vuga we do social games. And I think one thing is very important, Vuga is not just one company, it's more like a swarm of independent small companies or small teams. So each team is cross-functional. It has product managers, artists, engineers in them. And these teams can decide on their own. So from a technical perspective, they can decide which data center to use, what technology stack to use, and, and how to operate the whole thing, as long as it works. And this is a driver for innovation at Vuga. And we do games, games like this one. So this is Diamond Dash, one of our games. And these games usually consist of a front end and a back end. So the front end could be Action Script, even more famous than Haskell, if you followed the keynote. Um, or it can be Objective-C, like here. And there's a server. And in this talk, we'll concentrate on the server part, um, which uh, for the, the products or the teams we are talking here is uh, implemented in Erlang. So whenever a new team starts, they can take the lessons learned from the previous team and think, how do I want to make my game? What technology to use? And they can draw on all the experience of previous games and then think how they want to improve on it. So for example, this game is one game that we will talk about, or Knut will talk about. It's called Magic Land. Um, when this game came together, this team came together, they had the experience of the games before where we had scalability issues with uh, our databases and they introduced Erlang and introduced a stateful model to come over these problems. Uh, because scalability is our main problem or has been so in the past because these games are played by millions of users if they are successful. So a successful game can have more than one million players, users a day uh, and up to 50,000 of them playing in the same minute which is quite a lot because at peak time this means that we will have to handle 10,000 or more HTTP requests coming in per second, which translates in a stateless model to over 100,000 database transactions per second. And half of them are about writing, and that's a problem. But over the past um, three years, with each team improving the technology, we solved these problems. So we are now, we still have respect for this, but we managed to solve that. So yes, we can handle this. By the way, this is Snippy, one of the characters of the game that we talk about. So the next step for us, like, okay, what can we do now? And the next step for us is not playing alone, but playing together with multiple players. And this is the innovation that we talk about today. So we'll first shortly, Knut will talk about the past, what we did in the past. Um, and then Knut and I will talk about the Khan project, which will be, is a multiplayer game uh, in, in Erlang. And uh, before Knut takes an, an outlook in the future, and in the end, I will just wrap it up. So with this, Knut, here you go. Thanks, Jesper. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, so um, by accident, uh, in one of our games, we set the stage for this whole thing. So we did some tiny little invention, uh, which we call a stateful game server, that is the fundament of now being able to build multiplayer games. Um, and how, how that came about, to provide some context, is um, we had this traditional stateless application server where um, the web server will always ask the database server for information and then mutate it in the database, in the, sorry, in the application memory, and then write it out to the database. So which Hickey, I'm sure, will be very unhappy with the setup. Um, because the big problem is that you make these round trips quite often, right? And maybe 10 of them per request. Um, and every request is basically the same. So you might have some um, data in the database that is very hot, but the database cannot make a distinction uh, between hot and cold data in the traditional sense. Uh, so you, you have to treat all of your data as hot data. And of course, this is bad since it means having hundreds of gigabytes around in main memory. Um, 
So massive bottleneck in the database, no matter if you shard. So we have 16 different shards in our biggest game, 16 different single points of failures, and they're all our, our bottleneck. Um, and at that point, a game called Magic Land came around. This was the first game we did in Erlang, and this was the first game I did. And here we, s we took the problem we had in the first games and we tried to kind of solve them in the fundamental core of them. So not kind of patch it by going faster or making it uh, less, um, uh, more lightweight, but actually solving the real problem. And the big idea here is to have a stateful server uh, implemented in, in Erlang with Erlang processes keeping state around. Uh, so when the user comes online, um, the application server will go to the database and ask, what is the current state of the user? And then as the user plays the game, um, typically for one, the duration of one session, it is all muted inside of the server. So now we have the server as main memory, so hot storage, and we have the database as cold storage. Um, when the user is then done playing the game and goes offline after some timeout, we route uh, the stuff out to disk again. So big reduction in database traffic. Um, and then how to turn this into a system is basically to have a bunch of these sessions inside of a single application node. And how to scale the system is that you have um, a bunch of the application <coughs> nodes, right? So it scales quite nicely. Um, and kind of in a linear horizontal way. <coughs> okay, um, over to Jesper again. So we had this foundation uh, which solved our scaling problems because uh, with this setup uh, we could handle the traffic that we had needed 100 servers now with three Erlang servers um, because nothing is faster than RAM at least uh, compared to database. So we thought about uh, how could our next game be like? How do we want to implement it? What do we want to add? Um, and we go through this, so just some, some thoughts uh, before we go to the implementation how we did it. And that game was called Game 8. I mean, we are very innovative uh, how our names. So there was Game 7, Game 8, Game 9. Um, and our basic idea from, from the engineering side was, hey, you're not alone. These are called social games. What is social about playing alone? Not so much. So let's change that. Let's make a multiplayer game. So if someone does something, I want to watch that. And maybe if he wants to, I don't know, pick an apple, maybe if I'm faster, then I snatch that apple away. Wouldn't this be a nice interaction? So we talked to our product managers, and they said, yeah, let's, let's try this out. So we did. But first, we spent some time on how could we do this. Because if two people want to snatch the same apple, who would get it? There might be conflicts. How do you resolve this? And we thought about three base approaches on how to think about the problem. A pessimistic approach, a schizophrenic approach, which um, um, come to in a minute what that means, and an optimistic approach. And pessimistic is the, probably the most simple one. So let's assume we have these two happy faces. The upper one is A and the lower one is B. And they, have, they are playing on their client. So they stayed on the client. And they have stayed on server-side processes. Like think of this as an Erlang process, holding the session of that user. <clears throat> so if A is now visiting B um, and wants to do something, change the state there, what happens there is that the client first asks for permission. He asks his own server process, and this is then uh, propagated to the server that holds the state for B, and that server then says, okay, yes or no. So it might update the change, so see this small tick, and sends the answer uh, back to the client which can then finally update the state. Because until then, there was an hourglass of death because you were asking for permission if you really could change that state. And that's not good. And it doesn't matter that uh, this change is also propagated to the client of B and he also sees what happened. The problem is, waiting on server responses, are you out of your mind? This is really bad for user experience and this is what we are doing. I mean, this is, these are games and if they are not fun, no one will play them and then it was a nice academic exercise, but it's not good. So this was a wrong approach. So we needed something where the client can immediately change its local state. So we came up with a second solution, which we call schizophrenic. Same setup, A visits B, but with one change, the server process of A holds a copy of the state of B. 
So when then the client makes a change, so let's say it picks up an apple, we will come to that example quite some often during the next 50 minutes, um, he just notifies the server, hey, I just changed state and picked up an apple. And the server immediately will change uh, that state, so update that state. And then notifies the server, hey, I tried to pick up an apple. And in this kind of model, the client is the leading authority for state not the server. So this server needs to ask its client, can I update that change, yes or no? And it might reject it uh, because the apple is already gone, which means like there will be diverging state. So in the upper one, let's say player A picked the apple and the lower one, player B picked the apple. And if it works, the client uh, would say, yeah, you could pick the apple, transform the server, and then the server would update its state and we are happy, happy case. But in the unhappy case, you could have something like one player in his version, in his view of the game, um, opens the door and the other one locks the door, which is bad. And then the first player, seeing an open door, walks through the door. And depending on the application, you have that bloody nose or ghost phenomena. Not good. So real interactions you cannot do with the system. And also on the server side, this is really complex because the server had to pass on some pending state changes, get an answer back later, and no. So actually, we implemented this, because it's so easy on the client side. But on the server side, this was not so good, and also limited. We couldn't do with this model what we wanted to do. So after, I don't know, two, three months, we threw it all away and came to the third model, which is optimistic. In this optimistic model, same thing. Um, the client does a change locally, informs its server, but this time the server just acts as a proxy and passes on the request to the second server. And that server then is the leading authority for the state of user B and can say yes or no. In this case, it says yes, and the confirmation goes back. And the problem or the challenge with this model is, what if player B did a conflicting change at the same time? So let's pick up the same apple, lock the door, whatever. Um, it does so because it does it right away, change the state update to the server, which will then reject it. Because, oh, sorry, you came too late, already gone. It sends back a message, and then the client has a problem, it needs to roll back. It needs to roll back to the uh, state B sharp, where user A picked the apple, or user A opened the door, whatever. And that's uh, quite complex for the poor client guys. In this case, we are talking about user people, uh, developers, using ActionScript to do that, which was initially the reason why we didn't follow the route, but in the end, we did it. And I would like to shortly talk about how we handle state on the client then. So client rollbacks, i sure you can build this. The problem is how do you build a client in this model? Let's have a look how we actually did this, um, how we built this. So internally, we do these lightning talks. So I first thought, um, this is a video recording of a talk we uh, uh, front-end developer and I, for the back-end, did. Uh, it's a, something like a 25 minutes uh, video with uh, bad sound. And even if you zoom in, you cannot see so much. So I better make these slides again. So let's assume you have a world, and there's a fruit tree, an apple tree. And you want to pick apples. I'm really writing the apple thing at this here. Um, and in the client, uh, that apple tree has a presentation of state. Uh, very simple, just how many apples did you already pick and how, much, uh, how many apples can you pick at maximum. A user comes along, user model moves there, animation plays, and when the animation of moving to that apple tree is finished, you pick an apple. Which just means you increment the counter by one. So you did a state change in the client locally. And this uh, transition is transferred to the server um, where you have a user process and a separate process handling the location or the world. Why we separated this from one to two processes will become apparent in a second. Um, we update the state and pass a confirmation back to the client. And what we do there in the client is keep a history of confirmed commands by the server. So the client is aware of what commands have been acknowledged and validated by the server. So in this case, play A moved and picked up an apple. Fine. Easy. Next step. Second player picks up an apple. Um, 
That user also has its own process holding its user session, its user data. And it also has its own world process, keeping everything related to its world. But since this user is visiting the other player's location, when you pick an apple, you update the state there. And you get a confirmation back, same as before. And the other user is notified, hey, player B picked up an apple. So it goes to this list of confirmed action. User model goes there, and you update the model in the state. Uh, you update it, the state in the client. Simple. It gets a bit more tricky, as you've already seen, when both players want to do the same. So bear with me one more time. User A picks up an apple and changes the state locally, because, as we said, the client is optimistic in the whole approach. So it just, just does that. And the state change is propagated to the server. But player B did the same at the same time. And both go to this one uh, location process over there, and whoever comes first is executed. So we do this sequentially, only one wins. So let's say a player B wins. That means um, the, the transition to change the state, to pick up an apple for player, B, uh, for player A, will be just invalidated and rejected. So far, so simple. So again, a confirmation that player B picked up an apple is transferred to the client, which will then do the same thing again. Move the player there, pick up an apple, try to update the state, which is no longer possible. So this is the case where we have a conflict, where the client realizes there is a conflict, you cannot do that. And what we do then is to throw away the whole state. We remove everything, we reset everything to the start at the time when the client started, and use this history there to remove, uh, to, to build up the state again. So we uh, basically replay all the action that has been happened and so far. And this is the way how we do the client rollback. And works quite nicely. Also has some side effects, things like, since we now, for the first game we did, so, uh, or the first time we have this in the game, we have a clear separation of state as the world is and state how it's displayed to the user. We can do things like, record this history and replay it later, let's say for integration testing and things like this. Nice benefits. Software architecture always pays off. So let's have a look inside how we do this on the server side, on Erlang side. Okay, so me and Jesper and one more guy, we had been in our ivory tower there for some time and it was time to come down <coughs> deep into the trenches and actually build this system and then we turn to our trusty old workers, Erlang. Uh, show of hands, how many do Erlang? How many work with Erlang? Okay, good. Uh, so I want to just highlight three big reasons for why Erlang fits well for this case. One is the process isolation. So each and every process has its own space and can run on its own and is isolated from the other ones. So you can have a server with tens of thousands of processes one crashes does not affect anybody else, right? Good for creating this kind of embarrassing, solving embarrassing parallel problems. Uh, the other one is networking. So uh, you have real kind of asynchronous event and networking in the VM, but you program as it is sequential code. So same thing goes for messaging. It makes it very simple to do uh, communication between process and so on. And the third one is the distribution mechanism. So a uh, big win for us is that you can have a bunch of these Erlang VMs and they can all talk together across the network as if they were just a local VM. So it makes creating a, a distributed application much easier. Uh, so as Jesper said, we have two different types of processes. One is the user process, and this one then holds the user state. And the state of the user is stuff like your inventory where you might have an ax. So I might go and visit Jesper, and then I want to bring my axe because I want to chop down his apple trees. I'm hey. really tired about hearing about them, right? Um, that's the role of the user process. Um, it is also implementing the real-time push to the client. Uh, so really the, the problem we are facing here is two problems. One is state synchronization, the other one is controlling concurrency, and this is how we then synchronize the states. So we push out updates to the client in real-time. Um, yeah. So the world process, it's similar, and it keeps the, the, the world state, so the, how that world looks like and, and so on. And um, 
the big thing here is that this serializes all the updates. So there's one process per world. A world is not that big, so there won't be that many concurrent users. Um, and thus, controlling the concurrency, right? So we just eliminate the concurrency from the server and serialize all the updates. We solve the problem with the clients racing to get their command in. And so there's no lag compensation. We just process them in order as we get them from the client. Um, the world process also implements the game logic. And the game logic um, is completely pure Erlang code. Um, and it looks very much like this. Um, so we take in the whole game logic and the command, and the command might be like pick an apple or place an apple or whatever. It produces a new state without any side effects whatsoever. And the reply we can send to the client saying, hey, an apple was picked. And with this, we can build transactions. And this is really nice because at the end of the running the game logic, we can then say we don't like the new state. There's something wrong with it. The user might not have enough money to pick an apple or whatever, right? And then we can just simply roll back to the previous version. And the way this is implemented is really nice um, because as a developer, you just add in assertions here and there. So whenever you feel this is a good point of adding an assertion, let's say the money can never be negative, uh, you simply throw an exception there. And then the whole system will roll back to the previous state. Um, another nice side effect is that you can take this state and a command, and it might crash in the server, and then to reproduce it, you just take the same state and the state, same command on your local workstation, and you can reproduce the crash exactly. Super useful for testing and debugging. So for the real-time push channel, uh, we need to work on the web, and not the web as in Chrome 14, but the web as in boring Internet Explorer on corporate networks. So we need wide support for, for whatever communication channel we want to use. Right, so WebSockets out of the window. And we settled on something called chunk transfer coding. Um, and this is kind of in the comet long polling style, but a bit more clever. And the way it works is that the browser will do a simple get or post request. And the, the server will simply not send a response right away. It will say the transfer coding is chunked and not include a content length. And then when the server has an update to send to the client in the form of a JSON command, for example, uh, it sends this tiny little chunk down on that open socket. So you can have this really nice real-time updates, right? Basically for free. And the overhead is very low. The socket is already open. It can pass through any kind of um, um, uh, proxies and so on, since everybody understands don't mess with the, uh, the chunk transfer encoding. OK. so. That's how to build the multiplayer game. And then this next part is how to build a scalable multiplayer game, right? Um, so a small shameless plug here. We have developed a web server in-house uh, with a focus on efficiency and robustness. So efficiency because we are CPU bound in our application server. So anytime we can save CPU means we can run more user code, more game code. And robustness because when we have these large volumes of traffic, they are all going to, at some point, end up in some funny state, the requests, and it's going to crash. I mean, this is just the way it is. When you have features in, in the server, they are going to interact and crash. It, it is inevitable. Um, and so it's focused just for us on, the, on our high throughput, low latency requirements. Uh, especially in our multiplayer games, we want them to be actually low latency. Um, and it follows the request response model from Rack and Wuski. Uh, so it will receive everything needed to handle the request, also including the body, so the headers, the body, and the, the URL. And then hands over control to the user process, which then does some processing, the magic that happens inside of the game server. And then the return value from this function is then the actual HTTP response. So it doesn't give you a socket and some helpers. It actually wants to have some more control. And on top of this, we can then build middlewares that add functionality, like, say, adding the date header and so on. So you can decide a bit per game and even per request which functionality you want to have that can crash, right? So you can say, I don't want to have any functionality, and then you're pretty sure it's not going to crash. Um, it is on my GitHub page, so if you feel, want to, feel free to use it. Um, bit of warning, though, it is not general purpose. It is very specialized for high throughput, low latency applications where you just happen to want to have an HTTP uh, parsing library and accept the pool and so on. 
So it can't help you do a website, for example. Okay, uh, so uh, for that, that was one part of the performance problems then of, of the scaling. So the next is the distribution problems of, the, of scaling the system. Um, and we kind of want to have uh, a system that is similar to React. So every application server will be completely identical to the next one. So no special software, no special processes or anything. You might assign different roles to them, sure. Like you want to have some of them being some kind of master, um, but they should be able to uh, coordinate among themselves without any configuration, for example. Um, and in this uh, particular game, uh, we don't actually have any database servers. So we will only have application servers in our attended application. And this is really cool. There's no operations anymore of these massively big MySQL clusters. Um, big win. And we didn't want to have, so part of having this identical node system is that we don't want to have any central point where we serialize updates and so on, which was one of the key uh, points of and the first Erlang game. We had a central component that was a single point of failure. And this game wanted to do away with that single point of failure. So this was, the f was to be the first game that actually had the capacity of being a truly available game. So no single point of failure would take down the whole thing. Um, and for this, we need a couple of things. So we need locking. Um, and in our use case, uh, lock is, uh, is used to um, make sure we only have one Erlang process per user and per world. So you might end up in a case where there's multiple processes per user, and they might write at, at so I might have interleaving writes. Um, and then you might lose data. And if a user is paying money for stuff in the game, this is, of course, very bad. So this was a requirement. And we want to have a dynamic cluster. Again, we want to have the React operation style of, uh, of, using, of running our application. Uh, because we know we are going to need to add nodes as we go along. Right? And thus, we embarked on a project called Locker. And it is a distributed locking table. Um, kind of in the style of, a bit in the style of Zookeeper and, and Chubby and these services, but the whole idea is that it runs inside of the Erlang VM, so you can just have your application service and no special Zookeeper cluster. And it has a compare and swap operation. Uh, and with this operation, you can implement really nice semantics. So we can say, if the user is not already online, create a new process and register it. And you can do this kind of atomically, so you have the illusion of atomicity there and in all distributed, masterless fashion, right? Super cool stuff. Um, and to ensure consistency, uh, it uses the right quorum. So it would typically elect uh, three or five, so an odd number of master nodes. And this is done by the user, so the system does not do this for you. And you elect some master nodes. And then there's two-phase commit to ensure that all the rights are kind of agreed upon by majority, right? Um, so pretty simple stuff from database books, nothing really clever like Paxos or like actually a properly implemented algorithm, but very simple pragmatic. So it's the first good solution. Um, and uh, another big win for us, it has asynchronous replication. So all your reads will be eventually, um, eventually propagated to the local, local databases, uh, local application servers. And inside of each one, there's an at table keeping all the locks. So you can do a couple hundred thousand reads there and that's kind of our use case. And this is why Sukipe is not that good of a choice for us. Um, another big win is that it's 330 lines of Erlang code, which is also a testament to how nice Erlang is in programming distributed systems. It is simply one gen server that is controlling an at table. And really a key piece of our infrastructure, really cool stuff, tested with proper and, and so on, might be released as open source. Um, yes, so that is this game. And I'd also like to share a bit about our super secret our upcoming work. Uh, really, really top secret here, so <coughs> you are special. Uh, so we have been doing some research. Um, and the big thing here is that we call it research to our managers, but really we are just sitting in a corner and, and hacking on some stuff, reading some papers, going to extended launches and so on. It's kind of like hammock driven development there. Um, and it has been really fruitful, actually. And this is also how we came up with Locker in the first place. Um, so we have been focusing on, on multiplayer games. And after thinking for a bit, we realized that, yes, we can do everything we want. Everything is possible. We can do a first-person shooter game, first-person role-playing game. We can do a real-time strategy game, like StarCraft 2, with thousands of units moving around in real time. 
We can do a turn-based game like chess, a bit boring, but still we can do it, and, and so on. I mean, the list is endless of the games we can do. Um, so uh, we want to talk to all of these product guys because we're kind of, we're kind of a product-driven company. And so we need to get support from the product guys before we can really start doing some cool stuff in the back end, right? So uh, we went and talked to them and realized that their ideas are, are completely out of whack with what we were doing. And we realized that it is really hard to implement a good multiplayer game. Because, because these guys, they will think of stuff that requires synchronization that is faster than light and stuff like this, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so uh, network latency really kills any good ideas. So the question became instead how far can you go? So which ideas and um, where can we meet in the middle? And the key here is compensating for lag. Um, and the general problem is that as soon as you need to go across any form of network boundary, so let's say it's even on 3G, it's kind of a big goal, we want to support 3G, playing on multiplayer over 3G, there's going to be massive lag. And it might be seconds in some cases, it might be half a second, it might be 200 milliseconds in the best case. And you need lag compensation. Um, and there's tons of research on this, tons of existing solutions, <coughs> really a lot of existing work, really interesting stuff coming from, from Blizzard and from Valve and, and all of the guys, they all have solutions for this space. Um, and we kind of read about them, we, we played the games and we found that yes, there's many good solutions, but they all really depend on the game you're trying to implement. Uh, so if you have a game where you, as a guy you're running around in a tiny room uh, shooting at other people moving around, it is very different from a game where you have a thousand units moving around in a much bigger space. Uh, so I'd like to share two kind of big ideas we have. Um, still on the idea station, not, nothing productified yet. And we kind of have divided the camps into two different types of games. So the first is first-person shooter games, and the second is real-time strategy games. And in the first-person shooter games, these are games like Counter-Strike and Quake and Unreal and so on, uh, here speed is king. So the whole idea of this game is that um, you, might, you, you, you have some kind of gun, and a guy runs into your view and then you shoot that guy, right? It's all about reaction time and there's also a bit of tactics how you move around and so on, but really it is about aiming and about uh, being fast. So you also want, of course, the game to support this. So there's no, no longer possible to ask the server, so when you do a shot, when you do a kill, it's no longer possible to wait for the server to resolve this and then come back to you before you display an animation, right? You want to display the animation right away when the user clicks. Um, and this leads to divergent simulations of the game. Uh, so typically you will use something called client-side predictions and there's many different solutions there. Um, but the idea is that the client is in lack of, when it does not have enough information, it will predict <coughs> the movements of other users. And it will always predict wrong because the users are uh, irrational and will move around to beat the system. Um, so you have this kind of anti-entropy mechanism that every update you send in the game is telling, okay, I'm moving in this direction with this velocity, and hey, I started in position X and Y. So if your client's prediction is wrong, um, you can use these kind of hints provided by the other players to teleport a guy around in the game, right, as necessary. Um, so we also want to run the game on the server side because we want to validate so we don't have any cheaters. Um, and the way we want to solve this is that the server will keep enough information about the history of, of the specific game, so it might keep a, seconds of, a couple of seconds of uh, state, uh, which you can use to validate delayed commands. So command might be delayed due to network lag, and then the server can understand that, yes, when you executed this command a second ago, it was actually legal in your state, but in a new state, it's not legal. Uh, so I will go ahead and fix this for you, so it might actually kill that guy that you shot a second ago. Um, so many of these, many of the pro players, you can see them moving around in funny patterns and so on inside of the game, and this is all to combat uh, this kind of lag in the server. Um, the next big camp is the RTS games, and these are games like StarCraft II and Age of Empires and so on, and this is games where you might have thousands of units moving around and you're commanding an army of, of, of great size. And here you cannot use the each and every unit broadcast everything it's doing all the time. Uh, so you really want to synchronize the, the simulations. Um, and if you have a game engine that is pure in the sense that with the same inputs, it will always produce the same outputs, um, 
synchronization, synchronizing the simulations uh, is just a matter of ensuring the same inputs in the same sequence on all, for all the players. Uh, so the idea here is that um, the server will actually buffer commands. So let's say I want to, to, to pick an apple. I will send to the server, I want to pick an apple a second into the future. And then Jesper was on a slow connection. He will also say, I want to pick an apple a second into the future. But since his um, connection is slower, it might take a bit longer for his command to get into the server. But then the server has enough time to see that these commands are actually executed at the same time. So we use the client t um, time. We trust the client in this regard. And we see that, OK, these commands are this should be run at the same time. And then the server will broadcast the commands out on onto all the clients. And they will run the simulation. And they will have the, all the, the same results. That's kind of the rough idea. Uh, so this is kind of a lockstep protocol. And StarCraft 2, as I mentioned, uses a peer-to-peer -peer lockstep protocol, while we want to use a server protocol. So we can also run the, the game on, on the server and control a bit more from the server and in the name of combating cheating and so on. OK. Thank you. You know, I just realized when we started this company, it was all about small bunnies and hopping around and unicorns, and also about Counter-Strike killing people. And Perhaps that's a normal progression of all gamers. Perhaps gamers are not so good. So, okay, so one thing I want to, to take away from this is, uh, so this is what we do right now uh, and where we are in the process of evaluating. But when you look at this step one, step back, it's more about how are you innovating? How are you adding something new to your technology stack? And I think at Vuga we are doing this because we have these small independent teams. And every team is starting from scratch. They are not forced to reuse code. If they want to, they can. It's a bit like using open source internally. Um, but they are allowed to, to just try out something new. And I don't know, two years ago, someone came with a crazy idea to use Erlang. Mm -hmm. Went pretty well. So having these small independent teams introduces chaos, but also innovation. And we are benefiting from this. Uh, so each team can add something small. It's not like they're reinventing the world. But based on what is already there, they just add something. Based on the, on the learnings of the previous teams. And this is how we operate. And when you think about it a bit more, actually this is a very old principle. I mean, so Isaac Newton did say something like this. And if you, I don't know if you're in London, if you pick up a two pound coin, look at the edge, it says this. Uh, so this is widespread, and this is how we operate. That every team just adds something more, and thereby standing on the shoulders of giants of the ones who worked on previous teams before. Um, but I think this is also something that you can do. So um, part of it is this spreading of knowledge going to conference like this. So this presentation, like all the other presentations which you did in the past, also on more specifics, how we do the stateful server in Erlang, for example, are available there. <coughs> this uh, slide uh, will also be available on the uh, TechMesh conf page. And also, uh, we've, I don't even know how many projects we open sourced. So please go to our GitHub account and just look this stuff up. I'm actually, I'm pretty sure that we will open source Locker when we come back. And uh, you can also do the same with uh, Knut's Ali server, which it's a quite cool project, I think. Do you have any questions? So I'm curious, uh, I think we should pass the mic to you. And then it will be challenging when Knut speaks to me. And so I was curious about the action script side. When you're replaying the, serve, um, the actual history, how efficient is that? Is it, are there any problems with performing? There's a very, very long history. Are there any issues on the clients that are actually replaying that in memory? Um, so, no, it's, it's actually not a big problem because the presentation is just a very small uh, command which uh, is in the form of a UI because this is how we communicate. So it's kind of like uh, NPC move coordinate something. So it's 30, 40 bytes and this is what we store in the command and it's sufficient. There are quite so many uh, because there are NPC running around and these movements need to be propagated as well. Uh, but still we are talking about hundreds of actions during a game session. It's not millions or thousands. And in this order of magnitude, it's not a problem. Um, <coughs> hi. Uh, 
I've got a question following on from that, actually. I was just wondering how the replay works from like a user experience point of view, like if the user sees something in the game and then it kind of unravels itself. Yeah, so um, this is the nice part where we have artists in the team. So they made up a nice picture, and it's a small buy, uh, and, um, and he just broke a window. So your screen is a broken window, and just like, oops, uh, I don't know who did that. And you, this is displayed for half a second, and then, then you continue. So you see it. It's, it's not secret. It's not possible to do it secret. But then you make some fun of it. I thought it's a game. It's nice. Any more questions? Hey, um, I'm interested to know how you handle, like, or how you're planning to handle synchronous gameplay in this manner on a mobile, where you can, you know, drop connection at any point in time. <laughs> um, so, do you want to answer this? I can offer you my mic. You can have your mic back. <laughs> or should no, I? You can answer it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So go, go in the audience, make this a live event. So uh, shortly, uh, so part one is uh, game design, uh, definitely. So um, if someone drops out, then maybe that person just lots that game, for example, from a technical perspective. Uh, so uh, <coughs> we don't have this game today. Uh, the way we want to, s to solve it is by using vector clocks. Um, and uh, fundamentally, we have some online games we can play online. You can also play them on mobile. So. This is a very similar way. You might be playing offline, you might, might make progress offline, and you want to synchronize with an online state. And then to see which one is the oldest, we can use a vector clock. And we can also use some heuristics from inside of the game. So we know there's some values that are always incrementing, for example. So you can, like if you're playing a, a game where you get a high score, you want to pick the version that has the highest high score. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It is really at the core of the game design, yeah. Which is why it's very hard to, to be in your ivory tower and come up with everything and then descend and deliver, right? Um, you need to work with the game designers. You almost need to be a game designer yourself to make this thing work out. Yeah. And also it's something that uh, currently two guys at home are trying out to see how it feels. So this is very often about Implementing it, then, then trying it out, make a usability test. Is it okay for the user? And is it okay? Does it feel right from the game design? And then go ahead, try it out, and then measure if it's fun or not. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah. these history lists, well, how long do you keep them? Uh, for this session, uh, because when the client uh, is, when, when it's off, it's gone. Okay. So it's only for, for this session, and this is also the reason why they don't get so long. Because when the client starts, it gets the most current version of the authorized state from the server. So it only changes up until that point. And the server itself does not need to keep this history because it is the authoritative uh, okay, entity so on the state. Okay, so when the session's ended, then the, then, the, then the server will have a new authorized state. If you come along, the next yeah. time you get a new state, yeah. a new okay. start state. Okay. And just another question, the teams, is it one team per game or is one team per yes. something in the game? Or? No, it's uh, one team per game. Uh, so the idea is, it's, it's basically how we scale the company. Uh, so uh, you scale the company by adding more teams without slowing the existing games, game teams down. Okay. That's the idea. And mm. we take some trade-offs to, to make this work. Mm. Uh, so it's a scale-out architecture on, on the organization level. So each team must be self-constrained. And there are very, very few shared services like for analytics, there's a shared service mm. and for CDN, but I think for everything else, payroll, payroll, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> finance, uh, we all have one kitchen. And so, yeah. but um, uh, the, the team must be as self uh, mm. um yeah, as independent as possible. Okay. I can walk. Yeah, just one more question about the teams, actually. I find that quite interesting. Um, just one, one thing. So if, if all the teams are kind of innovating and doing different things, how do you manage, like, if a lot of different technologies are being brought in and then when people kind of leave and you've got this big technology stack that you're looking after, like, how do you manage it from, like, a support point of view? And that's a challenge, right? Uh, so how do you do that? Um, first one is um, bring people together that they know each other. Uh, so that's one side. So it's kind of like, so um, 
So did, do you know this, this Spotify is on TechCrunch? There was an article about how Spotify do this. It's very similar. So uh, we have game studios which act as their tribe. So it's a, it's a bunch of teams. And what they have described, this is our teams. But we also, what they described as guilds, we have kind of like, we don't even have a name for that. So that's, um, let's say for all backend engineers go to lunch every Thursday. And uh, twice per month they sit down together. That's why I had this 25 minute recording. I can show it to you, it's, that's awesome. Um, uh, where we, no. <laughs> where you are where, where basically talking. This are just lightning talks, a 10 minute time box, tell something. And um, one of the most important points that we exchange knowledge on is the architecture of the upcoming games. So I think for the last two or three, Knud is a regular guest and telling us about these multiplayer prototypes. And he's also, we have a similar setup for, for backend engineers, for front-end engineers, product managers, analytics, artists. And he also goes then to the product guys and tells, hey, we can do this. Who wants to do a game with this? So, um, and, and, and these, um, this is kind of like a rubber band, uh, keeping the, the company together and distributing knowledge. And it's not sufficient to exchange all the knowledge, but you know, hey, this guy does something. And when I have the problem, I know whom to contact. And so it's, it's starting uh, this discussion. And it's also about much about culture and policy. If another game has a problem, hey, yeah, of course, it's OK to drop off your stuff and help them. Um, so this is how we compensate this. But it's a, it's a trade-off of having these uh, separate teams. So it's, it's not perfect, but uh, it works quite well. Hi, uh, great, great talk, guys. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, so you've got the user processes, independent user processes, and then you've got like a, a world process, I guess, which is the game logic. Uh, and is that, is that shared by the user processes? So if, like, if, have you sharded the world processes into small little independent isolated worlds? And how many sort of users can fit on that world? And if I want to play somebody else in another world, is that possible? Or are you sort of stuck in your home world? So I think we should answer that one. Uh, so this first iteration of the multiplayer game is still very much entrenched in the ordinary way of doing social games. So it is one world per user. Um, you can go and visit your friends' worlds and, and play together with them. Um, there might be some inherent limitation in the product, but it doesn't make sense to have a thousand guys running around there. Uh, but we could definitely do a hundred but it looks like more the limit will be like 10 because it doesn't make sense from a product point of view. And you have the same problems in the really big game service, like the AAA title, that it doesn't make any sense to have a thousand guys inside of a room like this all shooting each other, right? So <laughs> the limit comes from the product, not from technology. And of course, we like to go all the way and have as many uses as we can, but, but the product guys say, no, it doesn't make any sense, so. They spoil all the fun. <laughs> but I mean, we can do fun benchmarks, right? So then that's, that's the fun we get to have. No. Yeah. Any more questions? So then I heard it's drinking time now. I one more. One more? Uh, one more panel. So, so, go for the panel first. Uh, sorry, I didn't say that. So, so, thank you very much. If you, um, if you have any more questions, we are running around. Actually, I wanted to, uh, we have some overdue Christmas calendars. So if someone is in desperate need of a Christmas calendar, please uh, come to me later on. I forgot them at the reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.